Excellent. All right, so yes, my talk is a practical guide to proc gen practitioners, an extremely non-descriptive name, so thanks for being here to hear me talk about whatever. Click. Nope. Nope. Which button should I click? <laughs> that works. Okay, so who the heck am I? Um, so my name's Lexi Peppers, she, her. You can find me on Twitter at AM Peppers. I am a net hack enthusiast is probably the best way I can think of to describe my kind of proc gen stuff. I've been here before mostly talking about net hack. And uh, yeah, I'm a technical designer at Improbable, which helped sponsor the conference. So yay for that. Super happy about it. Um, super short, they make Spatial OS, which is this technology for helping you make massive multiplayer games really easily. So check it out. I would love if there was a roguelike built on Spatial OS. That's just something I want in my life. And so what am I actually here to talk about? So something else about me is that I've loved getting to know kind of proc gen practitioners throughout the whole community. Uh, I was lucky enough to come and speak at Roguelike Celebration at the first one, I think, in 2016. And that was kind of the time where I was welcomed into the roguelike and wider proc gen community, which is something that's meant a lot to me. And it's meant that I've had the chance to meet all kinds of proc gen practitioners. And I use the word practitioner because that includes hobbyists, professionals, you know, people who have just made a Twitter bot here and there, or who just like reading about proc gen, or who have shipped full titles that are like entirely proc gen. Everyone is some kind of proc gen practitioner, and I love talking to all of them about proc gen just because I love it so much. And one thing that I noticed that was interesting talking to so many people is that proc gen practitioners tend to have very different attitudes towards proc gen and the method of working with it. And some of this makes sense because proc gen is a very wide field. It includes most kind of disciplines within games. There's lots of different techniques, but there seemed to also be an underlying philosophical difference in how people thought about proc gen. But the more I thought about it, I noticed that there was one thing that seemed to be in common, which is that proc gen is magic. And before you grab your pitchforks and drive me into the sea, I don't mean like video games are made by elves in the night, proc gen makes all your content for you, it's so magical and wonderful, that's not what I mean. Uh, the easiest way to explain what I mean, so I made a slide for a talk that I gave locally to people as an introduction to proc gen. And this is the slide. <laughs> and beside being an excuse to use a really cool picture <laughs> in a slide deck, the point I was trying to make to kind of these proc gen newbies was that people tend to talk and think about proc gen in a way that's very similar to the positives of magic in like fantasy universes, where magic is a system that is presumed to be real inside of that world. And in those, magic is often appealing because it's this mysterious, fascinating thing and it obviously grants great power to the people who know how to use it. And people seem to often talk about proc gen in a similar way of it's this kind of magical force where if you can understand it, you can do these great things. What people talk about less is that I think proc gen also has the downsides of traditional magic. <laughs> it is very unpredictable because it's so mysterious, especially if you're new to it. Uh, it can do things you don't expect and that are very bad. In worlds where magic is real, you don't go to a wizard to get them to like fix your fence because they're just as likely to turn it into a sentient fence or send it back in time or grow it 10 feet and turn it blue. Like it's not a good idea just because magic exists to use it to solve every problem. And similarly, just because proc gen is very powerful does not mean it should be used to solve every problem. Part of why I think this happens is because proc gen is beguiling in a very fantasy kind of way. <laughs> Uh, that promise of you have these infinite worlds, you have endless gameplay possibilities. There's a feeling I think that you can get when you are working with your generator and you're putting in your inputs, you're watching it you know, spin out content and it feels kind of like spinning straw into gold. Like it's this very appealing thing and you can just watch your generator and, and play with it and see what it does. And then days have gone by and years have gone by and there was maybe a game you were trying to make but you don't really remember anymore. <laughs> Not that anyone here would know anything about that. <laughs> so this is something I like, this idea that magic was kind of an analogy for how we think about proc gen. And the other reason why I thought that this was interesting is that we tend to understand that magic is not monolithic. Even in worlds where magic is just taken to be a true thing, there are lots of different ways people approach magic in those universes. So Harry Potter, magic's presumed to be real. There's still lots of different people who approach it in different ways, who specialize in different areas, who have different kind of thoughts about what magic means to them. And I think that that's really cool because I think that proc gen is like that too. I think that all of us who work with it have very unique relationships. 
I think that we take our own experiences with the world. I think that we take our own kind of dreams for what we want to make as creators. And it gives us this approach that no one else could have. You know, I think that it's just everyone <laughs> has a really unique perspective and, and can make something that no one else could. And, you know, no one can be compared to each other because everyone's completely unique. And then I realized, wait a minute, I've been playing D&D &D and its derivatives for most of my life, and everyone knows that all magic users fit into nine distinct character classes. <laughs> and that everyone in the world can fit into some mix of those character classes, allowing for multi-classing, of course. So in this talk, I'm going to describe how every type of prop gen practitioner maps to an analogous D&D spellcasting class. <laughs> and you might have heard someone describe themselves as a prop gen wizard, but by the end of this talk, I hope to hear people say they're a prop gen cleric. So some ground rules. To keep things organized, I'm going to maintain the arcane divine distinction <laughs> in traditional D&D. So our arcane classes are going to be wizard, sorcerer, bard, and artificer. And our divine classes are going to be cleric, warlock, druid, ranger, and paladin. Now, some of you just physically restrained yourselves from shouting, Alexi, <laughs> warlock is not a divine class. <laughs> To which I would like to respond. First of all, as you know, Warlock was not a main class until 5th edition and 3.5 as an optional class. Invocations were technically spell-like abilities, not spells, putting them outside the Divine Arcane distinction. And besides which, by the point they hit 5th edition, Divine Arcane is no longer a mechanical distinction. So really, it can be argued either way. Also, I have the microphone, and I'm making shit up. So you can fight me. Wizards. <laughs> So, the archetypical arcane caster, the first thing most people tend to think of when they hear magic, and for good reason. The wizard is someone who thinks of proc gen or magic as a system of rules that can be mastered, something that can be understood and taken advantage of. And particularly, their approach to it is rooted in study and understanding. If you learn all the formulae and magical sigils and you know everything that underlies magic or proc gen, you can, you know, change the universe or make really cool dungeon levels. Same thing. Uh, the other thing interesting about wizards, they're very prone to specialization because of the fact that they view prop gen or magic as something that they should understand fully and tend to be that, you know, you can understand one piece of it better than anything else. So in the same way that you have magical wizards with domain expertise in illusion or evocation or necromancy, you get proc gen wizards who have expertise in generative narrative or ecosystem simulation or necromancy. Uh, <laughs> and wizards are really powerful. They're really good to have on your side. They're often at the forefront of their particular you know, proc gen technique, though there are some downsides. Uh, wizards often uh, end up with a very arcane and incomprehensible way of speaking that's based on their deep understanding, a kind of knowledge of PCG, WFC, ECS. <laughs> But don't worry, if you memorized all the characters in Rogue, you can handle the acronyms. <laughs> and the last thing is that if you have a wizard in your life, uh, they can be prone to, you know, falling into the clutches of evil, uh, staring too long to the abyss, filling out too many grant applications, and <laughs> you'll want to be ready to take them for walks in natural light and feed them home-cooked meals if you see any signs of imminent turn to villainy, such as sudden obsession with jewelry or trying out spelling their name backwards. Sorcerers, the next arcane class. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, sorcerers are people who have an inborn uh, capability for magic because someone in their family tree got intimate with a dragon. Um, mapping that to proc gen, <laughs> first of all, I'm not going to say some people have an inborn capability for proc gen because that's kind of gatekeeping and shitty. Uh, and I'm not going to speculate about your relation's interest in dragons because that's none of my business. Uh, <laughs> To me, what defines a proc gen sorcerer is that they're centered around intuition and introspection. So to them, it's about using proc gen to kind of look inward and have a dialogue with yourself through your tools. So they're examining their own ideas, biases, assumptions, using proc gen as a lens to do that. So it's certainly powerful, you know, proc gen is still a, a worthwhile method, but in the end, it's a focus where the power is coming from inside of you, and proc gen is more a method of unleashing it. So proc gen, in this sense, is more like a mirror that's reflecting your own ideas back at you in a way you can visualize and tweak and kind of work up with from there. Building on the theme of introspection, we hit the bard. 
Uh, now, I could just say bards are the ones who make rock gen music, but if you haven't picked up on it, I am going to do my full due diligence on every single one of these. Because <laughs> you find folks deserve nothing less. So, I define a prop gen bard as someone who does tend towards artistic, musical, and narrative sides of prop gen, but the thing that defines them is that they use prop gen to guide and enhance their own creativity, basically making it part of their creative process. Um, and one thing interesting about this is where a lot of times with other classes, you'll be trying to get your prop gen to kind of blend in with handcrafted content. A proc gen bard is more willing to embrace the weirdness and strangeness and kind of flavor of procedural generation that other classes might be trying to hide. So it's still, you know, their hands on the keyboard, they're still doing the creating, but uh, they're much more willing to kind of let this feeling of proc gen flow through them and create something more unique and, and strange. Um, as a proc gen bard, your arch nemesis are the people who make those memes of like, I watched a, made a bot watch a thousand hours of Olive Garden commercials and it made this script that was clearly handcrafted and not made by a bot. Uh, if you meet those people, you are actually entitled and required to fight them on site. <laughs> uh, and the final arcane class is the artificer. Uh, so these in D&D are people who have skill in the magical arts themselves and they take those years of diligence and training that taught them how to make a really rad fireball and they use that to just make a stick that they can hand to a peasant. <laughs> and the peasant can say abracadabra and blow a smoking hole in their village. And I don't know about you, but I respect the hell out of that. <laughs> Within ProcGen, these are the people who filter the mind-bending nature of ProcGen into approachable interfaces. They take all of that weirdness and they make something, a tool that people can use in order to, you know, have sliders with buttons and labels and stuff where they don't have to change their entire conception of what content is in order to work with it. Uh, so I think this is really impressive. It's hard enough to grok ProcGen yourself and make it act like you want to. Making it actually seem like something more friendly is a skill unto itself. And I don't think I'm allowed to have favorites, but artificers are the real MVPs. <laughs> now the divine casters. Um, you might be thinking, like, where am I going to go with this, given that the divine casters in D&D is like, bless Talos, god of storms, who gave me my abilities, and I'm not going to say that Odin gave me the ability to make shitposting Twitter bots, but... <laughs> To me, what's interesting about the Divine Casters in ProcGen is that they do have this kind of external focused relationship where they think of their generator as an entity. Um, now, I'm not saying literally they think that it has its own agency and that you know they've gone full Dr. Frankenstein and created life. Uh, I mean that we have a feeling sometimes that our ProcGen kind of generators are something external to us that we're able to have some kind of dialogue with, that's able to have a capacity to surprise us, and we can think about it and act in a way as if it had some degree of agency. Um, I'm also using generator in a very broad term. Um, this could be you know, any kind of ProcGen techniques. And I do think that you see this more often with things that are kind of AI-ish, but I think it could apply anywhere. And the final thing there is that, so I put out a post on Twitter a while ago asking people to define their relationship with ProcGen, and I got a lot of really insightful, interesting responses. Uh, but my favorite phrasing was from Darren Gray of Early Radio, who said, ProcGen is a half-wild horse that I try to steer in certain directions, but often takes me to fun, unexpected places, or keeps running around pointlessly in circles as I curse. And to me, that's the kind of uh, attitude of the divine classes, where you can think about and talk about your generator as if it was an external half-wild horse, uh, instead of just being a set of rules that you're applying. So, first up, the cleric. In the same way that the wizard is kind of emblematic of the arcane, the cleric is emblematic of the divine. And this is especially a wacky one in that, what am I going to do? Clerics are like, really about deities. Uh, the thing I would ask all of you to consider, have you ever developed rituals around your work? <laughs> Do you ever have a rule in your generator that runs better if you run it twice instead of once? <laughs> and you don't want to think about why, you just know it works better that way. Or do you have code with a comment that just says, don't take out this code? <laughs> and you're hoping no one ever asks you why that comment is there or why that code is there because you don't know. All you know is that it works better. Uh, how does this microphone work? I don't know. <laughs> but I trust that it will. And I even have certain rituals. If it stops working, I'm going to try turning it off and on again. Um, I thought I'd be holding a microphone, so I'd hold it differently. This one's not held, so my rituals are going to fall flat if it stops working. Uh, and if all else fails, I will reboot my computer, which is the default ritual that every single one of us prescribes to. And this, to me, is what defines a cleric kind of way of thinking. It's embracing the fact that sometimes you just don't need to know. 
sometimes you can kind of just have faith that um, if we keep trying, eventually things are probably going to work out. <laughs> and you know, the generator might be cold and indifferent to your deadlines and feelings. But if you're willing to kind of, you know, keep going at it, keep trying to figure out what the hell it wants, then eventually things will probably work out. Uh, I think that, you know, we might not want to admit it, but we act like clerics a lot more than we would like. And finally, the warlock, the, the much, you know, advertised divine class. Now, to me, they're very similar to the cleric in that they see the generator as this external thing that they're working with, but where the cleric is about beliefs, the warlock is about bargains, a kind of deals warlock, if you will. <laughs> and they are coming to an arrangement with their generator. It might not be willing to listen to your commands, but if you're willing to do some give and take, if you're willing to change your inputs in a way that makes it happy, uh, and you're willing to kind of modify your process, then like it's probably going to meet you halfway, probably. <laughs> Uh, and so it's pretty simple. You just meet its whims and you get ultimate power in return. And how, you know, <laughs> that doesn't sound so bad, does it? Uh, and the mark then of a good proc gen warlock is that they do get very talented at knowing how to nudge their generator in the right directions. It might be unreasonable, but, you know, they can find a way to work with it. And this is where they might see their generator almost like a teacher or an overlord who is, uh, taking them in strange directions that don't make sense at the time, but hopefully eventually you'll be able to look back on it and have a better understanding of, oh, that's why it wanted me to do this. Um, or you'll be five years down the road with a generator that still makes no goddamn sense, but you are too far <laughs> down the road of promising to use it to be able to back out. So, you know, choose wisely. Druids, another one you might be wondering, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> Uh, they're the extension of nature's will. I think we all could use a little bit more literal druid in our lives. Sniff a tree every now and then. Uh, and I would love if what I was going to say is that there was a proc gen technique that let you speak to animals or turn into a bear. But the best we get is playing caves of cut. So <laughs> uh, this is another one where the meaning is not so much literal, it's a bit more abstract. And to me, it's that a druid is someone who sees their generator in a way that's focused around tending, nurturing, and observing it. They still have this external relationship, but instead of seeing that generator as their teacher or their overlord, they see it more like a student or even like a child, like something that they are uh, watching learn and they're trying to meet its needs and they're kind of pruning it. So where a wizard might see creating a generator as like snapping together all these intricate little pieces of a model, uh, the druid sees it more like bonsai, like you're kind of pruning away the parts that you don't like, but it's still growing in a kind of organic fashion and might be able to surprise you. And um, so we watch them kind of grow and they can surprise us and we're taking care of them. And I think that obviously this applies more to like evolutionary algorithm, like multi-generator or multi-generation generator stuff. But I think it can come up in anything. So I've made some uh, Twitter bots using tracery and tracery as far as Procten goes is like fairly understandable. You have your inputs, the rules are pretty easy to understand. Like I know what's happening under the hood, but I still often find when I'm working on a Twitter bot, I have this feeling like I'm, you know, I'm putting stuff in, I'm watching what it does, I'm feeling proud of it, or I'm feeling angry at it, and I'm trying to kind of cut away the bits I don't like, and I'm like, God damn it, these stupid bots, it's okay. It's my fault, I made you. <laughs> I'll try and make you better. And you, I get this very weirdly parental sense of pride in my, in my Twitter bots, you know? Um, God bless, <laughs> shit given bot. My dear child, they grow up so fast. Uh, and now we hit the ranger. So from a spell casting standpoint, kind of just a shitty druid. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Drizzed and other <laughs> rangers. I played a ranger, it's okay. Uh, the strength of the ranger though lies in their ability to guide their party through dangerous terrain and know, you know where are the good paths and where are the bad. And so when you're working on a team, the ranger is the one who can guide you all through the oatmeal-y bogs of procedural generation which is hugely important. Uh, they might not be as talented uh, in one particular area of proc gen as something like a wizard, but they know which paths are safe to tread and which will lead to ruin. They can tell you maybe generating your entire map from the terrain up, like pixel by pixel is a very bad idea, but maybe doing something like defining chunks of maps and snapping them together is a good idea, that kind of thing. So very important in a team standpoint. And finally we get to the paladin. And I'll admit this one gave me a bit of trouble. Uh, 
from a D&D standpoint, they kind of don't do as much casting magic of themselves. They kind of defend other spellcasters. And within D&D, they're kind of hated. Like, <laughs> they have a reputation for being like overly self-righteous, initiating inter-party conflict, um, not being willing to compromise. I, I played a paladin. It's OK. I can say these things. Um, but what it clicked for me is that I was reading the comments online. It's a bad idea, I know. And I saw someone saying, well, you should never use procedural generation for anything in your game. You want to be coherent. Because, you know, Procton is random, and randomness can't be coherent. Lies. Lies. Yes. <laughs> you get it. You might be a paladin. <laughs> uh, put up your hand if you've ever had to explain that proc gen is not randomness. And then keep it up if you're really sick of having to explain <laughs> that. Or how about trying to define what a roguelike is? Or someone asking you, is this game a roguelike? Is this game a roguelike? Or uh, having to say, someone saying that Procton Designer doesn't make any sense because it's just an algorithm. What would a designer have to do with it? Or how about the people who say that uh, Procton algorithms can't be political or have kind of bias or views because you know it's just an algorithm and algorithms are inherently neutral, right? <laughs> yes, you should boo. <laughs> Druids are the heroes who stand up and say that just because it's made with an algorithm, the algorithm was made by human beings who brought in their own biases and assumptions. Biased input leads to biased output. And just because you're using an algorithm as an in-between does not absolve you of your ethical obligations as a creator. We need paladins. <laughs> oh, slides. So they're the hero. I got too carried away, man. Paladins are so great. Uh, they are the people who have the strength and energy. <laughs> to continue cor correcting the misconceptions and representing the actual strengths and weaknesses of prop gen. Um, it's very important, particularly, to have paladins in the room if, for any kind of planning and marketing, or else you'll find out, by the way, your game's going to have thousands of unique NPCs you can talk to. And no, we won't hire additional writers. Why would we do that? An algorithm's going to do it. <laughs> you need a teammate who can smite people. And so that wraps it up. So to have a quick overview, we have our arcane class casters, uh, wizards, a few proc as rules they can study and master, sorcerers who see it as a medium to examine their own ideas and intuitions, uh, bards who embrace it as part of their creative process. It might be a little bit weird, but it's kind of unique to them. We have artificers who build tools that provide an approachable interface for other people. And on the divine side, we've got clerics who embrace not always knowing, who use rituals in their work. We have the Warlock who bargains and kind of coaxes the generator into a useful direction. We've got our druids who tend to nurture and kind of organically look after their generator. We've got rangers who guide the non-experts and know how to avoid common pitfalls. And we've got the paladins who fight misconceptions and ensure a fair representation of proc gen as a tool for better or for worse. Now, of course, everyone uses tag me memes now as a way to explain that information. I'll tweet this. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is how the money will talk these days. And so we've all had a lot of fun here, I hope. Uh, this has obviously been a talk somewhat in the intent of amusing as much as being full of knowledge, not quite as academic as some of my previous talks have been. But I do think that there are some actually interesting questions inside of here to consider. And the first is just to think about how do you view your own relationship with ProcGen? And how does that impact the way you work? You know, obviously, I hope that you find it useful to define it as one of the classes I listed here. And I hope that you come tell me what class you are, because I'm really curious where people are going to fall. Um, but I think just taking the time to think about, you know, what is really your view of procedural generation? And how do you actually work with your generator? Even if you don't change anything, doing it with intent, I think, lets you be that much more efficient and kind of meaningful in your work. And secondly, Consider how people around you might feel differently. You know, talk to other people about what they think of as proc gen and listen to how they describe their generators and what kind of terms they use. It might be a perspective you find really weird, especially if you're firmly on the arcane side and they're firmly on the divine. But uh, I think that you could gain something from trying out a new perspective. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of multi-classing. Uh, you don't have to abandon your levels in your existing class, but you might find that uh, you make for a more balanced party composition <laughs> if you are willing to mix and match a little bit. Um, so let me know how that goes. Keep talking as a community about how you feel about your generators, because it's something I find fascinating. And make sure to preserve your spell slots for difficult encounters. Uh, have a great conference. I don't know if we have time for questions, because I don't have a timer. But uh, thank you. <laughs>
have time for questions? What time is it? Is there an organizer around? There's Noah. Hey. <laughs> We do have, okay, does anyone have a question? What class are you in? Oh, what class am I? I forgot to say, yes. So I think that in my day job, I'm a ranger. I'm not working as directly on ProcGen, but I'm doing a lot of kind of talking to other people about it. And in my spare time, I kind of surprised myself when I wrote this, I think I do act like a druid a lot of the time. Um, I'm from the woods, so it kind of makes sense that I've ended up with very <laughs> nature-y classes. It's weird how that works out. And then I think I have like one level in wizard that I indulge when I go to GDC, and I'm like, yes, tell me exactly how wave function collapse works, yes. Um, but yeah, so mostly ranger druid with a tiny bit of wizard. Any other questions? Hi, uh, do you think there's a relationship, if any, between uh, types of production implementations that are inherently less introspectable, like neural nets, uh, versus just like rolling some random numbers and gluing them together, uh, that's like a fully transparent process, uh, and the class system? Uh, yeah, a good question. So I do think, like I mentioned, that I think that um, druidy kind of approaches, and even just the divine classes as a whole, are more directly applicable to things that are more kind of opaque and have a feeling more where you're not sure, like it's harder to know exactly what's going on under the hood and you do have a feeling of kind of working through multiple generations of a generator. So I think there is a tendency that some things fit more into others. And yeah, on the introspection uh, approach, it definitely could be true that things that are more opaque can maybe be a bit harder to learn from in an introspective way. Um, but I do find it interesting. I, I feel like when I hear people talking about this, I am always surprised that, you know, like I said, tracery is a very, like, clear, understandable uh, technique, but I still end up thinking about it in a druidy kind of divine way. And I think that people work with um, kind of black box techniques and still are able to look at the outputs and kind of get a sense of the possibility space and see, you know, okay, how do my ideas turn into that possibility space and can still glean a feeling of introspection from that, even if they don't know, or it's harder to know exactly what's going on in that black box. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, absolutely oh. awesome talk. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious, in your experience, and what ProcGen parties actually work the best? Oh, that feels like a highly controversial trap kind of question. <laughs> Um, one thing is that I think that it can depend on your party size, uh, as in D&D. &D. So, uh, like, I'm working in more AAA, and I think that in AAA, having some paladins around is really important, like I mentioned, uh, having some rangers, stuff like that. Um, I think that you need more of those support classes, uh, just because you have enough fighters and rogues in the room that you want to make sure that, like, there's someone who can bridge the gap, because I think that a wizard can easily get written off as you know they're talking in tongues, who knows what they're working on, like the fighter and the wizard are going to have difficulty speaking to each other. Um, whereas I think that having some support classes in there helps bridge the gap. If you're on smaller teams, I think that you are more able to have just like a pure spell casting composition. Um, though like I said, in terms of wizards having problems kind of looking increasingly down and down into their uh, code and kind of losing track of time and sense. I think that that's a reason why wizards kind of need some other classes to balance them out. So like a wizard sorcerer might be an interesting um, pairing. I think that kind of ma my favorite is if you were to take a bard and surround them by like wizards so that they had access to all kinds of power and then we're just like, yes, I'm going to make the weirdest shit you've ever seen. <laughs> That would be just my personal, probably favorite party composition. I've also run an all bard Tomb of Horrors, so you know, <laughs> that's just my preference. But I would be curious for the groups of roguelike developers in our community to describe their own class compositions and then we can judge how well they seem to work. <laughs> All right, so um, I was wondering, just sort of curious if you had any ideas you'd like to uh, share about a few pages out of the ProcGen Universe Monster Manual. <laughs> With all of these classes around, I'd like to know what kind of horrors that they're battling here. Yeah, that's great. That is a very good question. I wish that I had thought of it ahead of time so I had any amount of preparation. Um, I think that 
Well, for one thing, I mentioned the bards and their arch nemesis, which are the people who pretend that they're using it for Chan and are not. That's definitely something evil. <laughs> Maybe like a mimic? <laughs> uh, yeah, like generally that sense of things that proclaim to be proc gen or not. I think that those are those are mimic kind of things. I think that when you get into like the liches and like the evil magic users on the other side, that's a cool one. Maybe that's the people who misrepresent proc gen actively and kind of <laughs> use it to do bad things and then make the whole field harder to defend for everybody. Um, I'm trying to think of a monster with an anti-magic field and I'm drawing a blank, but that would be the real concern. Beholders? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Uh, Yes, beholders, anti-magic fields. I don't know what that would be. I guess producers? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that I love producers. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ooh, the hydro of polynomial complexity. That's very good. Yeah, high fives for that gentleman. <laughs> Um, again, please come up with them and tweet them because that would be fantastic. I should write a generator. <laughs> All right. All right. Great. Cool. On that note, uh, thank you very much, yeah. Lexi. Thank you, everybody. Have a great conference.